Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, welcome to the 86th webinar of the PG Track program. And uh, today we are going to talk about clinical approach to pulmonary atrial hypertension. Uh, various spectrums of pulmonary hypertension with underlying disorders are seen, and this is definitely an exam case. It's also important for your clinics. So uh, we have on this journey with us our respected Dr. Jay Balachandar, a very eminent teacher now, present teacher is Dean of Super Specialty Services in Makala Venice Sagar Medical College in uh, Puducherry. On this journey, I also have my colleagues, Professor Girish MP and Professor Sumut Korean, both professors at GB Pant Hospital, and my colleague, Dr. Nitish Nayak, who's Secretary of Delhi CSI. So uh, let us uh, start this journey, and I invite uh, Dr. Balachandar, sir, to please share his uh, slides and uh, start his talk on clinical approach to pulmonary arterial hypertension. So welcome once again, sir, to this uh, platform. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. So uh, <laughs> can you give me permission to share the screen, please? Yeah, please, sir. I think it is already given to you. Yeah, please. Yeah, please make a uh, sir host, co-host, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please do that immediately. Have you got it? No? Yes, sir. Please share your screen. Can you see it now? No, not yet. No, sir. No, sir, not yet. I've kept it open here. Yeah, so you have to click on the share screen button. Yeah, I did that. And uh, then select your presentation. Just top one, it says. Not yet. Sir, have you opened your presentation? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's open, and I've kept it minimized. I have, uh, it's, it's on the desktop. Okay, so, uh, so come to the zoom again and click on the green color share screen button. Yeah, that's what I did. And uh, it says where share. Yes. Something is coming. Allow zoom to share your screen. Yes, sir. Open system preference or something it's telling. Otherwise, you have the slide with you, you can move it. No problem. Sir, I, I'll do that, sir. Just. Yeah, this is better. <laughs> you can move it. Okay. So let's start. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. And thank you once again for this uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, talk to you 
on this uh, topic. Actually, the uh, uh, today's topic, even though it's pulmonary atrial hypertension, I decided that I talked to uh, Mohit also that I would rather focus on some things which are asked in the exam about uh, uh, pulmonary atrial hypertension. The problem is that when a patient of Eisenbanger syndrome, which is a commonly kept case in the examination, the candidate has to, uh, he cannot use the word Eisenbanger syndrome straight away in the diagnosis because the examiners may or may not like it because they will think that you know the diagnosis. So you'd have to talk about pulmonary artery hypertension. You have to say this is a case of severe pulmonary artery hypertension and whether there's left to right shunt or right to left shunt or other diseases, congenital heart diseases uh, there. And of course, the etiology of primary pulmonary hypertension always is there at the background. So with this in mind, the first part of my lecture, I'll go a bit slow because uh, the, there are certain things which the uh, postgraduate students uh, should know and the uh, examiners always insist on asking about uh, hyperkinetic pulmonary atrial hypertension and obstructive pulmonary atrial hypertension and what exactly happens in the physiology. Next slide. This uh, 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 studies are all well known and uh, some of the uh, topics actually I have taken from Rudolf which is a little old, but Rudolf's uh, book is, uh, I think, still available. It is a uh, little difficult to read, but uh, many of the pediatric cardiologists swear by this book of uh, Rudolf. And some, of course, I've taken from uh, Dada's, which is a little older edition of Dada's, which gives you a very clear picture of the... Uh, so the important thing is now a few things. One is, what is the response of the pulmonary vasculature to hypoxia or to flow? What is the effect of high pulmonary blood flow on the pulmonary vasculature and the deleterious effects of high pulmonary arterial oxygen saturation? And of course, the important thing which I will stress repeatedly is the left atrial pressure and the pulmonary venous pressure, which is often forgotten when you talk. Actually, when you say pulmonary atrial hypertension, you always refer to transpulmonary gradient, which is between the pulmonary venous pressure and the mean pulmonary arterial pressure. But... Uh, when it comes to uh, Eisenmenger or uh, secondary pulmonary atrial hypertension, we forget the importance of the left atrial pressure. And of course, a little bit about polycythemia. Next slide. So uh, the left to right shunts are frequently associated with pulmonary atrial hypertension. Now, there are certain cardiologists, especially now people have started using atrial flow regulators and all that. So they rarely believe that, I mean, they believe that secondum ASD is uh, perhaps not associated with Eisenbanger or pulmonary atrial hypertension at all. What is really pulmonary atrial hypertension and looks like ASD is perhaps primary pulmonary atrial hypertension. This is, of course, a debatable point. Many of us have seen cases of ASD with uh, Eisenbanger syndrome. I'm sure all of you also would have seen. So this is uh, an important thing that why the ASD, which has flows as large as ESD, uh, does not develop pulmonary atrial hypertension. In fact, pulmonary flows three to four times larger than normal can be accommodated in the pulmonary vascular bed without an increase in pulmonary atrial hypertension, at least on a short time, a short term basis. Next slide. So we come to the factors in the development of pulmonary atrial hypertension, a little bit of theory, then we go to the clinical, I mean, hemodynamic approach. There is a transmission of pressure from the LV to the RV or from the aorta to the pulmonary artery, which causes pulmonary artery hypertension. Now, the basis of pulmonary artery hypertension in BSD is the presence of the fetal pattern in the lung fleas. Now, we think that if there is no fetal pattern, fetal pattern is a must. In the face of a large VSD, all the blood will go into the LV uh, through the low resistance RV into the PA, and this would be incompatible with life because at a time when the LV is not uh, ready to take this load, it will be flooded with a large left to right shunt. So the fetal pattern is a protective phenomenon. And this prevents, at least in BSD, for patients going into severe heart failure. But the important thing is this fetal pattern also contributes to pH. So the normal inclusion of the pulmonary vascular blood does not occur in a patient with large VSD or PDA in whom the communication is at least half the size of the aortic communication. So involution can result as a result of other factors. You know that uh, in premature children, uh, child, uh, it involutes very quickly. As you bring the child from high altitude to low altitude uh, to sea level, involution occurs. 
but this involution will result in failure at the cost of a reduction of pulmonary artery hypertension. Next slide. There are some unexplained theories still. Why patients with PST of similar size may or may not have hypertension? Why some small PSTs are associated with maximal pulmonary artery hypertension, considerably larger ones are associated with little pulmonary artery hypertension. And it also fails to explain why a large, you can have a large PDA and you need not have pulmonary artery hypertension. Similarly, patients with endocardial cushion defects without PSTs, uh, like osteum primum ASDs, but with appreciable, will have more pH than those with secondum ASDs. So let us see some uh, explanation to some of these. Next slide. The explanation is that transmission of systemic pressure and consequent slow regression of pulmonary vascular resistance is a one factor. And this is a major factor in, develop, uh, in sustaining pulmonary artery hypertension. Of course, there is individual susceptibility of the pulmonary arterioles and uh, predominantly in females and uh, also uh, for primary pulmonary, you know the role of genetic, that is the bone morphogenetic protein 2, which is also BMPR2, which is responsible for 70% uh, of the patients with familial pulmonary artery hypertension and 10 to 40% of patients with sporadic uh, uh, idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension. Now, left atrial hypertension, which is secondary to MR, which is seen, uh, like, for example, sometimes the uh, large VST and there is an incompetent uh, mitral valve, it plays a result in causation of pulmonary vascular disease. Then hypoxemia and acidemia, they also cause constriction and cause, uh, and this is a very constant factor in TGA. Next slide. There is a multifactorial theory. I've already told about BMP. I have told that females are more susceptible. What time is an important factor. And whatever factor operates with time, it will be more effective the longer the period. So few infants with the most severe defects have irreversible like uh, grade 4 to 6 Edwards changes. And few adults with an innocuous type of ASD will escape them in the fourth or fifth decade. It has to happen. But uh, in ASD, you know, it is uh, in the fourth or the fifth decade. Next slide. Now, this is a slide which uh, many postgraduates uh, would not have seen, but it is there in the uh, probably the second edition of the uh, NADAS. A beautiful slide because it gives you the questions which the examiners ask in Eisenberger or severe pulmonary artery hypertension. What are the major factors and what are the minor factors which are responsible? And with each diseases, we will repeat this slide again later. But what are the major factors? which operate. The first factor is increased pressure in the pulmonary artery. The second major factor is an increase in the pulmonary venous pressure. The third is the flow, that is increased pulmonary blood flow. And the fourth, of course, is the increased pulmonary oxygen saturation. So these are the things which operate to develop pulmonary artery hypertension. In addition to that, there are uh, minor factors like uh, uh, decreased systemic saturation, which actually overlaps with the major factors, and then you have uh, decreased pH and hematocrit. So this operates in all these conditions, second MASD, prime MASD to some extent. And after that, you'll find second MASD, apart from an increased pulmonary blood flow, increased pulmonary oxygen saturation, there's nothing, no other factors is operating. Whereas most of the factors operate in a tetralogy of fellow who has had to go on a quartz or a surgery or a TGA with PSD. So these people may develop a, uh, pulmonary artery hypertension early. Next slide. So this slide is very comprehensive. So if you summarize the major and minor factors for development of pulmonary artery hypertension, we have divided them into major factors and minor factors. The major factor is the increased pulmonary artery pressure, as I already mentioned, increased pulmonary venous pressure, increased flow in the pulmonary artery, increased pulmonary oxygen saturation. The minor factors are a decreased pulmonary artery of sa uh, saturation of the systemic artery, decreased pH and increased hematocrit. So these factors, if you keep in mind, and if you can tell the exam systematically, you will have no problems in assessing pulmonary artery hypertension or Eisenberger syndrome. It's, uh, next slide. So it is likely or unlikely in various, uh, in ASD secondum, we have said it is unlikely because there is only increased flow. And this is just a theory 
based on that slide, which uh, I have already shown. In ASD primum, it is possible because there is increased flow and increased, if there is an MR, there is a likelihood of an increased uh, uh, pulmonary venous pressure. In TAPVC, it is highly probable because of increased flow, increased pulmonary venous pressure, etc. In large VSD or PD, it is probable. In large VST with mitral valve disease, it is virtually certain. In tetralogy of fallow, it's unlikely un until late, and especially after uh, uh, the uh, shunt operations. In TGA, it is virtually certain because you have all the factors which are operating, increased pulmonary artery pressure, increased pulmonary venous hypertension, increased flow, increased oxygen saturation, decreased oxygen saturation, and increased hematocrit. So all this will uh, is virtually certain with TGA and certain with TGA with VST. Next slide. This is just uh, the same thing, which I have put it in a tabular column for the benefit of, uh, uh, you can look at the slides. Uh, how is it likely, how it is unlikely to develop an Eisenbanker reaction with various conditions. Next slide. Uh, uh, same thing. Uh, so we found that second VSTs or PAV, PVC is the least likely to develop since there are only a few relative factors. In fact, it's so rare that now people have started telling it is, uh, especially in younger patients, uh, that was a group called Velour group in which there was a lot of female patients with uh, severe pulmonary artery hypertension with ASDs, but then they are probably cases of idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension with right to left shunt across the ASD. And this is one factor which clinically you may have to see and determine if it is a ASD-like situation. We'll see that. And uh, of course, TG and VST, uh, it is highly likely, as I've already mentioned. Next slide. Now, look at this slide very carefully, because this is the physiology. And this, once you master this, uh, you'll be able to determine everything. The pH may originate from increased pulmonary blood flow with a normal pulmonary resistance. So blood flow, resistance, left atrial pressure, etc., are operative. Here, when you say hyperkinetic, that means there is an increased pulmonary blood flow and normal or only slightly raised pulmonary vascular resistance. When you say increased pulmonary resistance, it is an obstructive flow. And there is an intermediate group where there is a combination of increased resistance and flow. Now, on the left-hand side, you have seen the systemic uh, 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 bed in which you have a mean arterial pressure of 80, and you have, of course, a flow, let us say, four liters. So the, uh, the in Boots unit, if you see, the, if you take the Ohm's law, pressure is equal to flow into resistance. So the normal systemic vascular resistance, SVR, is 80 by 4 or 20 units. In the normal pulmonary system, it is 12, let us say, mean pulmonary artery pressure. The uh, flow is about, again, four liters. So you have a normal pulmonary vascular resistance of three good units per liter square. Anything more than three goes in favor of uh, Eisenberg. Next slide. When you talk of hyperkinetic pulmonary artery hypertension, this is the picture which you should have in mind. The normal pulmonary vascular resistance is again shown on the left, 12 by 4, which is three units. And there is a high flow state which occurs, especially large pulmonary arteries with admixture lesions like uh, DORB or TGA, where you have, let us say that the pulmonary artery pressure is 50. The uh, flow is about 12 liters. So if you divide 50 by 12, you have 4.2 units per meter. It is a hyperkinetic system, can occur in ASD also. It is upper limit uh, because you know that after six units, the ASD becomes inoperable. So this goes into upper limit, but still there's a large left to right shunt. And how to be determined uh, by hemodynamics and to some extent clinically, whether it is operable or not. Next slide. This is the combined flow in increased resistance, which I said on the uh, left-hand side is the normal pulmonary vascular resistance. And when you have a combined flow and a pulmonary vascular resistance, you have 80 pulmonary artery pressures, which is mean divided by eight, it will give you 10. So 10 units per meter square depends on the situation. If it is ESD or if it is uh, uh, PDA, at PDA, uh, sometimes even at 10, you can close and operate. Next slide. And this is the last one which comes in the exam or everywhere else. That is the normal flow, but high resistance, which is Eisenbanker syndrome. And here on the left-hand side, again, is the normal, which is three. 
and the pulmonary artery uh, mean pressure is 80. The flow comes down. The important thing in uh, Eisenberger is a reduction of flow and not too much, but it comes down to four liters. So you get a uh, pulmonary vascular resistance of 80 by four, which is 20 units per meter square. So this is, once you know this concept of what is hyperkeratic pulmonary attribution, what is, uh, if you are very clear in your concept of a pulmonary vascular resistance. So when Wood uh, defined it, he knew uh, very well that it is more than three units per meter square and the mean pulmonary artery pressure more than, uh, pulmonary uh, artery pressure more than 25. Next slide. Just a, a little comprehensive slide. You don't have to waste time too much on that, except to say that as the flow reduces, the pulmonary vascular resistance increases. The mean pulmonary artery pressure may remain the same. It is the flow which comes down and raises. Uh, it is all second. The flow comes down because of increased pulmonary vascular resistance, and the flow uh, causes the this equation causes an increased pulmonary vascular resistance. Next slide. So obstructive and hyperkinetic is that it may be associated with the normal uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and the site of pulmonary vascular obstruction is exclusively within the arterioles. And if increased, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is associated with pulmonary vascular uh, resistance. But if PCWP is uh, at the uh, is increased, and then you will find that the primary obstruction is not at the level is at the pulmonary arteriole, but at the level possibly at the level of the pulmonary veins. And a hyperkinetic flow and a pulmonary vascular obstruction secondary to pulmonary LV disease, if you correct it, it will come down. Same thing, pulmonary vascular obstruction at the arterial level. Some cases of ASD in adults, which I said, and all the many cases of ASD, uh, the patient survival becomes a problem. Next slide. Without uh, surgery. With hyperkinetic uh, obstruction, there are two contributions. Pulmonary vascular obstruction combined with hyperkinetic obstruction. This is what is seen in children, and it will determine the efficacy of the treatment. So pulmonary flow, resistance, absolute pulmonary pressures, etc. And then the intimal proliferation and medial hypertrophy. These concepts I have brought in, even though it is theory rather than clinical approach, but it will help the candidate in getting a good picture of the uh, flow resistances which are uh, asked in the exam. Next slide. So with this, we come to the uh, pulmonary uh, uh, arterial hypertension as defined by uh, uh, the uh, Eisenmenger or Paul Wood, then you know that it is actually a mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 25, the pulmonary vascular uh, index more than three wood units per meter square for a biventricular physiology. And most forms of pulmonary artery hypertension related to CHD is Eisenmenger syndrome. Next slide. And these are the basic lesions in terms of the uh, severity, which they will always ask. The, uh, uh, if you ask the trial or if you want to write it, the classical description of Somerville in 98 and ventricular septal defect uh, heads, atrial septal defect is quite rare, PDA, atrial ventricular septal defect, truncus arteriosus, etc., with large pulmonary arteries, single ventricle with large pulmonary arteries, and TGA. Next slide. So uh, the epidemiology is well known that you know that. Uh, as uh, maybe because of the surgeries and the shunt lesions, there has been a rise, but many places it has come down. Uh, in fact, I was told that you don't get much cases of uh, PDA or something because in Kerala, at least they have closed all the PDS and all the ASDs and uh, some many of the VSTs. So that means the pulmonary artery hypertension is quite rare in the uh, in some parts of the country. Next slide. So the classification of the primarily hypertension, which was proposed, which is called as the Dana point classification. We won't go into great detail. And uh, then later on in 2013, we had a nice classification. And it is all, of course, there are so many papers now which has come on pulmonary artery hypertension again and again and again. Jack also, we have got recently pulmonary artery hypertension. So different types of classification are used. You have anatomic pathophysiological classification, but uh, clinical classification, and of course, 
we have the pediatric pulmonary arterial hypertension. Next slide. And this is some of the slides which I've taken, I think, from the postgraduate uh, uh, essentials, which is a very good book. And there are, you can read it also, the anatomic pathophysiological classification of pulmonary arterial hypertensions. Uh, next one, next slide. It's a little, and the clinical classification, which is uh, of congenital systemic, the left to right shunts associated with pH. You have the Eisenberger syndrome. You have pH associated with systemic to pulmonary shunts. You have pulmonary arterial uh, hypertension with small defects and pulmonary arterial hypertension after corrective surgery. This sort of clinical classification is necessary uh, based on history and examination. Next slide. And of course, you have for those people who are interested in pediatric, there is a the uh, pediatric pulmonary arterial hypertensive vascular disease. Next slide. Next one, please. We'll forget the nice classification. And uh, so you have uh, uh, the same four categories which I have described, the Eisenbanger, the pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is uh, systemic pulmonary shunt, and of course, after corrective surgery. Next slide. So you have, if you have an elevated pulmonary artery pressure, what happens? There are three possible causes. High pulmonary blood flow can occur, high pulmonary vascular resistance with reduced arterial compliance, high pulmonary venous pressure. So this is the basic pathophysiology of an elevated pulmonary arterial pressure. Next slide. Mean pulmonary arterial pressure. With increase in blood flow, the pressure can cause the endothelial cell dysfunction and shear stress and circumferential wall stretch, et cetera. So the clinical variables have already, uh, to some extent, told you age, the type of cardiac lesion, genetic and epigenetic factors, and environmental factors, and comorbidity. So these are the clinical variables. Next slide. So these are some of the mechanisms of uh, which contribute to development of increased pulmonary vascular resistance in congenital heart disease associated with increased pulmonary blood flow. There is uh, definitely a decreased production of nitric oxide. There is definitely an increased turnover of serotonin. And there is an altered expression of potassium channel. So some of these things which will get uh, uh, importance later on, if you really want to treat uh, pulmonary artery hypertension, you have to think of nitric oxide donors. You have to think of uh, the serotonin antagonists. And of course, potassium channels may have a role in the future. Next slide. And this is the frequency. I've already described this. Next slide, please. So when we uh, now come to the uh, congenital heart diseases, which have an isomantic reaction, so that you can see, and when you get a case, how do we do about it? The first, of course, is AST. Next slide. So this is rare. As I told you, it is rare. So when you have to make a diagnosis, do not diagnose, uh, at least the exam, do not tell ASD with pH straight away because that clearly will tell you that uh, the candidate has even seen the echo, perhaps. Uh, nobody can die. You must say severe pulmonary arterial hypertension and a right left shunt or a bidirectional shunt. The possible cause is uh, uh, ASD uh, or it can be idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. So hyperkinetic pulmonary arterial hypertension, of course, is much more common. And remember that the pulmonary vascular resistance is less than one unit. Now, if ASD is present in younger individuals, we are quite sure it is usually a pH with ASD with a right to left shunt. And this is what the Velour group also has shown. But of course, after the third decade or fourth decade, pulmonary arterial hypertension will develop because of intimal changes. Next slide. So the important thing is uh, the history. There's a long history of recurrent respiratory infections with left to right shunt. And uh, uh, just uh, digressing a little bit for the postgraduate say, today the definition of recurrent respiratory infections is slightly changed. And uh, it is uh, previously we used to say more than three or six with admission with IV antibiotics, et cetera. But the Indian Academy of Pediatrics in 2013 had adopted uh, very simple methods of more than six in age less than three years and more than three in age less than uh, more than uh, three years. So that is a simple definition of recurrent respiratory tract infections, uh, which has been adopted by the IEP. 
can go through it in the uh, in the net. You can see it's called I think Principi 2030, uh, the IAP definition of uh, recurrent respiratory tract infection. And I think many of uh, examiners might accept that. But uh, anyway, do, uh, also mention the traditional definition. Don't go by only the uh, recent definitions. So that is the important thing of recurrent respiratory tract infections. The second is, of course, replacement of the symptoms with dyspnea, fatigue, angina, intermittent bluish discoloration, particularly on exercise. And this has to be demonstrated uh, in the, if possible, if the patient is stable in the examination. Do not forget the exercise-induced uh, bluish discoloration, which uh, clearly tells you that we are dealing with the right to left shunt, especially in AST. Palpitations are important. And of course, there can be a paradoxical impulse. And sometimes you can have uh, symptoms of polycythemia, like high viscosity, like uric acid, arthropathy, headache, etc. Next slide. So this is the history uh, of uh, coming to the general examination. Important thing is uniform cyanosis and clubbing, where you have you can have polycythemia. There is a, a skin condition which determines intermittent right to left shunts. What is the skin manifestation? of intermittent right to left shunts, especially in AST, and that is tuft erythema, seen in fair people. Uh, so this tuft erythema is one of the causes of intermittent right to left shunt. There are prominent veins. There is no suprastoral pulsations. There are pulsations in the precordium. Remember, AST always has a tumultuous precordium. And in the second left intercostal space, sub xiphoid pulsations, liver pulsations, etc. These are seen on general examinations. You do get Harrison sulcus, you get blackish lips on back uh, and on back rest. Uh, patients can be tachypneic. Next slide. And this is, of course, uh, if you see, this is the Harrison sulcus classical. Next one. And of course, you have effort intolerance, which is very classical of ASD, not so much. And uh, the PDA, of course, is the best tolerated. Uh, and uh, But uh, in ASD, you have a lot of tolerance. So you have to uh, get a history of fatigue and hemoptysis is also there important for uh, Eisenbecker symptoms. Next slide. Now, uh, if you take squatting in Eisenbecker, and this is also, also a frequently asked question, it is quite uncommon, but it is can be present in Eisenbecker like reaction or severe pH in ESD is about 15% and 5% uh, in ASD is so PD, it is possible to have a history of squatting in younger uh, children. And uh, the JVP, there is a giant A wave in ASD, and sometimes most of the others will have a large V wave. Next slide. Now, an examination, there is definitely a left parastatic relief, and this is pretty common in ASD. And most important thing is most of the times the LV is impalpable, and sometimes we get into problems because we do think that there is a heaving type of apical impulse, which the candidate gets confused. It is not the heaving apical impulse of uh, LV, because LV goes posteriorly. It is pushed posteriorly by an apex, by the RV occupying the apex. And it's just a continuation of the left parasternal heave, which looks as if that the LV is palpable. So an impalpable LV is uh, a palpable P2 is present. Uh, the important thing about uh, even uh, a debatable point, if you take the latest uh, brown wall, the 12th edition, he says pulsations at the third left intercostal space is characteristic of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, we are not very sure about this. It is debatable. Uh, you have to debate it with your uh, examiners. And uh, the third left intercostal space is infadipa. The fourth and fifth are the RV body. sub is RV inflow. So these are the portions of the RV. So if you want really pulmonary artery pulsations, it has to be at the second left intercostal space. I don't know why he has made this uh, statement, but uh, he may have some reason because having seen in broad world, we have to think. And palpable P2 in 66% of the cases. And there is pulmonary ejection click, there's an ejection systolic barber and a Graham steel barber. All these are signs of severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. So when you present in the examination, if you say, I would diagnose severe pulmonary arterial hypertension based on my findings of a left parasternal heave 
uh, pulsations in the second or third left intercostal space, a pul dilated pulmonary artery, a palpable P2, so diastolic shock, uh, sometimes pulmonary ejection click, and a uh, loud P2, which is also heard at the apex. Now, the thing is that the second heart sound will be single in EST. And sometimes, you know, strangely, about 6% PD also can be seen, and it will be widely split in AST. If in PDA, if the second heart sound has been paradoxically split earlier because of a large left to right channel, then with the onset of Eisenmenger, the paradoxical split will remain in order, and the order is P2A2. But since the P2 occurs earlier, it may occur a little wide, but A2 also may come closer because the shunt reduces in PDA. So it can vary. It can be single. It can be widely split. It can be para can remain paradoxically split, uh, or it can be normally split in PDA with isomeric. So single is VSD. So wide split is ASD, and uh, normal behavior uh, is PDA. Remember. One condition in which the pulmonary artery, uh, second heart sound P2 is heard at the apex, but there is no pulmonary arterial hypertension is AST. AST with, uh, is the only condition in which P2 can be heard at the apex, but there need not be a pulmonary arterial hypertension. Next slide. And of course, there is a distinct cardiomegaly in ASD, and the apex is shifted, and there is a lateral retraction. This lateral retraction demonstration is very important. A uh, little difficult in female patients, but in male patients, look carefully because the LV goes completely posterior and you get a lateral uh, retraction of the LV, impalpable LV. And the whole area from the left sternal border to the uh, apex is contiguous. And of course, uh, I have already told you about the other things. About. Occasionally, you can get an RVS4, which is palpable in the sub C4 area. Some z palpation is very, very important because we should not forget it in any type of pulmonary artery hypertension because the RV has to be felt. And the best method of feeling the RV is to get a sustained heave, which is there, the sub z palpation. You can put your finger like the older teaching. You can put your thumb and try to see the sustained palpation in, uh, uh, pulse. Next slide. And of course, uh, the important good thing about ASD is that the uh, ASD is one thing in which all the waves are problem. A wave is there, there is the next descent, there is a Y descent, and, and there is a B wave. All are uh, present in the JVP if it is elevated. Now, this finding which I've mentioned is very difficult to make out. It is X more than Y if the RV is compensated, X is equal to Y if it is decompensated, and X less than Y. Perhaps it is very difficult, but whatever it is, you can see the downslope of the uh, uh, wide descent. If the wide descent is rapid, you know very well that the RV is uh, good. If the wide descent is a little slow, there is an obstruction or perhaps there is a decompensation or a diastolic dysfunction of the RV. And of course, if you have a good C wave, you know that the contractility of the RV is good. The C wave in the JVP is C for contraction, C for closure, and C for carotid. So that's the way to remember about the C wave if fast in the exam. Next slide. So the first heart sound may appear split. The second heart sound of an ASD will have a low P2. Uh, and the second heart sound is split still in expiration. And it is fixed with a low banging P2. And uh, sometimes you do get, uh, you use the term relatively fixed split. Some examiners are fond of asking this. Uh, this is also very debatable. But uh, a relatively fixed split means it's a narrow split because of severe pulmonary artery hypertension, but it remains split on expiration. So that is what is called as a relatively, it's not a wide fixed split as is characteristic of ASD, it's a relatively fixed split. So this relatively fixed split will occur when the pulmonary artery pressure is at least two thirds of the systemic pressure. So this has got some correlation, uh, but again, it depends upon the uh, the examination. Uh, it's uh, the term we don't use much, but if somebody asks you, this is what is relatively fixed split. And of course, uh, there are three types of uh, pulmonary artery hypertension in ASD. Next slide. So the RVS3 is heard, RVS4 is heard, pulmonary ejection click may be heard, and Graham Steel Burber 
can occur in AST. Remember, AST is one condition. The cause of pulmonary artery dilatation, you can get a Graham steel. I mean, you can get a pulmonary digestion murmur, even where the pulmonary artery pressure is not that much elevated. But normally, the presence of a, a Graham steel murmur tells you that the pulmonary artery systolic pressure is at least 80. And it is high pitched, it is early decrescendo, decrescendo. It may become softer with expiration, but it, when it becomes softer with expiration, it will increase with expiration. Otherwise, it has the same connotation as that of a aortic digestion. Difficult to differentiate, but you know, the murmur is identified by the company it keeps. That means you have all signs of severe pulmonary artery hypertension, then that is definitely a PR murmur. And then you can have a TR murmur, and the same thing can occur in primary pulmonary hypertension also. Next slide. Next one is just the ECG, usual thing about uh, ECG. And uh, <clears throat> the presence of QR pattern in V1 and doubling of the R wave is important uh, uh, in V1 and V2. When the R wave suddenly doubles in V2, the R height of the QR pattern V1 tells you that your RV pressure is supra systemic. Previously, we used to call it type A RVH, but now it is just a supra systemic RV pressure. Next slide. And this is good X ray. Next one. Next one, please. We'll go a little faster. And next, the, next we come to this, it's called as atrioventricular septal defects, AVSD. It is also uh, it can be partial or incomplete. And it is part of the, it can be part of the Down syndrome, which you know very well. And it is also a case which can be kept in the exam, osteum primum defect with the cleft ND. Next slide. Now here you have, you have shunts across AST, you have some shunts across VST, you have MR and you have TR. So you have to pick up all these things clinically and the patterns will uh, depend upon the PVR. But whatever it is, there is an obligatory shunting from LV to RA. So when there is an obligatory shunting from LV to RA, just like other body type of defect, but it's an atrioventricular septal defect. So this is, it is, there, even if the PVR becomes higher than SVR, because the LV is uh, pushing the blood into the RA, it is still present. So if the PDA is pre also present and the PVR is elevated, even though there is an obligatory shunt is present, the right to left shunt across the PDA can still occur. So important thing about this uh, hemodynamics of AVST is very important, is the presence of this LV to RA shunt, which is not stressed much, but it is interesting to note. Uh, and this will also give you the classic uh, V wave prominence in uh, uh, JVP. Next slide. And of course, the pa partial AV canal defect is important because it's like an osteum primum defect. Next slide. But here, again, uh, there is an earlier occurrence of pulmonary artery hypertension, especially uh, you know that there is a Down syndrome. And uh, the uh, most of the times, the shunting is similar here to VST because the RV pressure is at systemic levels. So RV, EDP, LV, EDP, everything will rise, etc. So next slide. We just go a little faster. So the history is very important when you have a case of AVST with pulmonary artery hypertension, Down syndrome, and uh, or fetal high drops, failure symptoms, and the male, female pa patient. There is no MR, the survival is better. So these are all the factors a to uh, which uh, are responsible uh, if, I mean, history, you have to ask of the AVST. Next slide. And of course, the important thing is the Down syndrome phenotype. You must know all the features of Down syndrome. Next slide. The semi increase, the brush fall speed, so the iris. The important thing about the AVST as opposed to VS ASD perhaps is the LV apex, severe pH, MR thrill, all this will tell you that you're dealing with complete AV canal. So that's an important thing to remember. That if you do get LV effects and what looks like ASD, but uh, you, do, you do get LV effects, then a true LV effects, then you know you are dealing with the, not just ASD, but you're dealing with the AVSD. Next slide. Next one, please. These are just uh, slides for uh, semi increase. And next one. So what is the cause of pH in Down syndrome? Common question which is asked. It's a, uh, the uh, Perloff uses the word proclivity for pulmonary vascular disease. 
One is frequent respiratory infections. The second is uh, the development of uh, pulmonary arterial tree is restricted. The third is, of course, small pulmonary vessels. There is a 35% reduction in the number of alveoli. And more important than all that is, of course, the hypoventilation, which is upper airway abnormalities with the small oropharynx. And, of course, there is sleep apnea. Next slide. With some tracheobalacia, etc. So these are the causes. And this is the uh, first um, auscultatory features of the uh, AVSD. The first heart sound is loud, the second heart sound is widely split and fixed, but severe MR will add to the widening of the second heart sound. And this always occurs when there is even ASD MR. The third heart sound is uh, uh, heard, and of course, there's a pan-systolic pulmonary effects that could be a MDM, which can be recorded within the RA. It is one condition where you can get a mid diastolic purpose, which can be recorded within the right hip frame because the tall LA V wave generates a diastolic pressure across a restrictive ASD. Next slide. Next one, please. This is the classical ECG picture, left axis deviation. Next one. Next one, please. We'll skip some of this. Coming to the VSD, we have an anatomical classification of VSD, which is described from the RV side. You have a sub subpulmonary supracrystal or doubly committed, which is called Kirkland type 1, a peripembrinous infracrystal, which is type 2, a peripembrinous inlet, which is type 3, and a muscular, which is type 4. It's necessary to have this. But as far as we are concerned, hemodynamic classification is uh, important. Restrictive VST, what is a restrictive VST? The PVR is normal. There is a normal right ventricular systolic pressure. It's called moderately restrictive when there is an elevated RV systolic pressure. It is non-restrictive when the RV systolic pressure is equal to. And uh, later on, when the PVR is normal, it is hyperkinetic. When, when there is a suprasystemic PVR, it is isometric complex. So this is an important thing to remember in the exam, the hemodynamic classification of ESD. Next slide. Next one. Now, the important thing in BSD is that the pulmonary vascular resistance does not fall to normal levels after birth in infants. It drops to levels of three to four compared to the normal drop of one to two. And the elevated PVR is largely due to the fetal architecture or to the retention of thick, smooth, medial in the first to two months. So you'll find that six to 12 months after birth itself, the pH is there. The pH is there in VSD. Very rarely you get left to right, large left to right shunts and then the pulmonary artery hypertension develops. Mostly it develops before two years of age. Next slide. And this is the Eisenmenger's complex, which is important in terms of history because the important thing is the heart of failure at uh, uh, so in any case of pulmonary atrial hypertension you uh, as Heisenberger, you have to give take a detailed history the age of the mother the symptoms of large vst hospitalizations and of course uh, uh, the altitude at which the child was born and the recurrent respiratory tract infections are less likely with asd than pda and amelioration of symptoms with decrease in size it can be either due to pH or due to casualization. Next slide. And typically, the ASD, uh, VSD is large. It's more than the 50%. Uh, these are some of the slides which has been taken from uh, Patlov only. So uh, the uh, candidates can uh, read this. That's a Eisenmenger's complex where you have multi-system systemic disorders. Next slide. And about the red cell mass. Next slide and about the uh, uh, other things like hemostatic abnormalities. Next one, renal abnormalities, bilirubin abnormalities, coronary arteries, etc. These are all uh, usual things of Eisenmenger's complex, which is VSD with pulmonary artery hypertension. Next slide. Uh, next one, please. So the important thing that uh, is the cardiorespiratory response to isotonic exercise. And that is an important thing with the right to left shunt. So augmentation of right to left shunt during exercise accompanied by a systemic arterial, uh, of course, we can't measure all that, but clinically you have to show that there is a 
increased uh, uh, cyanosis on exertion. Next slide. And uh, of course, clubbing. Uh, next one. And other complications which are what? Next one, please. And of course, uh, this is uh, uh, general examination. You have a, a shunt. I think uh, we have to go a little faster because we are reaching our. Uh, so look at all the features of general examinations. And look, the, unlike ASD, that we do precordial overactivity, the precordial palpation will be this. Next slide. And on auscultation, the important thing is the second heart sound. And please describe it as single because there is a component still fuse. And so the respective descending limbs, RV cross and PA pressure cross, simultaneously with aortic cross. So it's a, you can't get a split second heart so normally in a VST and there'll be no burber usually. Occasionally, you can get a decreased no burber. And when the PVR becomes more than S, uh, SVR, sometimes the auscultatory signs become like that of primary pulmonary hypertension. Next slide. And you will get a Graham steel burber in VST also. Next one, please. Get a right axis T. Coming to PDA, which is the last, and it will depend upon the size, the pulmonary vascular resistance, the adaptive response of the LV to volume overload, and of course, there will be respiratory distance. Remember, when the PDA is non restrictive, the aorto systolic pressure is equal to the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Next slide. We'll skip some of these slides and come to next one, please. One thing which I would like to tell you uh, of course, one question in PDA is that can you have uniform cyanosis? in the PDA other than differential cyanosis. The answer to that is perhaps that there is uh, uh, some shunting which is occurring at the uh, 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 pulmonary uh, artery level, or perhaps the uh, right atrial pressure is increased and it shunts right to left across uh, AST. Next slide. So these are some of the slides on uh, PDA, but more important, next one which I would like to stress in the end. Next one. Before I close, uh, this, uh, this is supposed Eisenmenger examination. Lack of time, we can't go through it in great detail, but the A wave is not that prominent as in the AST. Next slide. Next one, please. Next. So I'm sorry, I have to go a little fast uh, because uh, it's almost one hour. Next slide. And uh, AP window is uh, sometimes distal AP window is kept in the examination. Next slide. Next one, please. Yes. Now we just give you a summary of ASD, VST, PDA. Cyanosis is uniform uh, and differential cyanosis in PDA. The JVP is not raised in VST or PDA, but it will be raised in AST. Suprasternal pulsations are present uh, in PDA. That's a very important thing you have to note in PDA. And there's no parastonal heave in VST PDA. S2 is white fixed with a single or normal split PDA. There is TR murmur, which is absent in VST and PDA and cardiomechanical. Next slide. What are the complex cyanotic congenital heart disease with Eisenmenger? That is also one of the questions. Truncus arteriosus with large pulmonary arteries. DORV without PS. This is the commonest. DORV without PS, toxic being anomaly. Single ventricle without PS. DTGA with VST, TAPVC, and surgically created aortopulmonary cell. We will end uh, here and we'll take in some questions. Otherwise, <laughs> it's almost one hour since we started. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, uh, for a very elaborative and very you know comprehensive coverage of uh, this uh, topic, sir. Uh, sir, uh, why, why does the S2 remain split even when there is no uh, you know increased uh, flow in a patient with AST, and uh, even when the, there's no shunt across the AST, the split still remains uh, uh, fixed and wide and fixed. Although, sir, you told that uh, it may become relatively narrow, but still it remains uh, you know that. Uh, Fixity still remains wide and fixed. Why it still remains? 
actually uh, the interesting concept about the uh, fixity of the uh, ASD uh, with the uh, uh, respiration. Uh, and it is a wide split, of course, is because of the hangout interval and all the explanations which you know. Sometimes RBBB can occur. But fixity is because of the, <clears throat> in addition to reciprocal changes of the shunt, even without shunt, it's a flow into LV which determines the fixity of the split. For example, if you take normal, let us say, left to right shunts, in inspiration, there is an increased flow into the RV, no doubt. There is a decreased flow into the uh, across the shunt into the RV from the shunt. But the important thing to remember there is that the flow into the LV is equally important. And that perhaps postpones the aortic uh, closure because there is no hangout interval on the left side that much. So it is a it is the LV flow, whether it is decreased or increased, which largely determines the fixity and both move in the same direction. It's not that they are, uh, one is moving closer to the other. Even in pulmonary artery hypertension, when there is the pulmonary artery, uh, P2 comes a little closer, uh, closer. A2 also moves in the same direction because of the reduction of the flow. The shunt diminishes, the flow into the LV increases because the reduction of the left to right shunt. So the A2 gets postponed, so the fixity remains the same. So it is the flow into the LV which determines rather than the reciprocal shunting and the uh, flow across left to right shunt in AST. In a patient of AST with PAH, uh, what is the no no uh, value for PVRI uh, beyond which uh, sir, you will not uh, consider the closure of AST? See, uh, we, it changes from uh, uh, institution to institution. At the GB Panth, I don't know what you teach now. We were taught 6, 8, 10. So, uh, but uh, whether you teach 4, 6, 8 or 6, 8, 10, uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, we still think that you can uh, go up to at least beyond 4 in ASD. Why this uh, variable uh, thresholds of PVRI for uh, different shunlation? Why not a uniform value? Why? Uh, this variable yeah. value. It depends upon the evolution of the pulmonary arteries and the base from which it starts. For example, in ASD, shunt does not get established unless the PVR falls to one to two units per meter square root units. From there to build up to that level, but once intimal proliferation and other things occurs, the PVR may be only up to three or four, but relatively the shunt stops and there is isomagrization which is felt. Whereas in VSD, as I've already said, direct transmission of the pressure into the, it starts with a higher value. And always in VSD, there is a small amount of uh, uh, fetal architecture, which is still maintained. And hence, uh, it does not matter uh, if you operate up to eight uh, and PD also up to 10. But of course, that depends on your uh, individual institutions. Uh, right now, of course, with interventions, you have difficult, uh, you have easier things like you can do a balloon occlusion, you can see the pulmonary sure. artery, you can see the pressures which uh, you did not have access earlier to that. Sir, uh, you told invariably in a patient VST and MS, uh, where uh, both the uh, you know uh, pulmonary venous hypertension component is also there, the increased flow component is also there. They invariably develop a severe PAH, a VST with MS kind of patients. But in generally, it is thought that whenever there is a PVH, the PAH may still remain operable. Uh, they say that you know because of the PVH has a protective effect on uh, remaining operable even if the saturation goes down. Why does uh, sir, why do PVH protect against irreversible PAH? Any opinion on that, sir? This is possibly because that if there is a increase of the pulmonary venous hypertension, maybe the flow is, uh, uh, I mean, it becomes a little higher and the flow is maintained to go get blood into the pulmonary venous. That's the only reason I can think of. I can't think of any other reason. But PVH is a very important concept of isomagrization for post tricuspid shunts like VST and PD. If there is PVH, isomagrization is always clear. This is also true. The other thing which, uh, which uh, if, uh, I had the big calculation slides, I uh, kept it, uh, I did because I, I thought it would take a lot of time, but it's very important for people to observe is the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure. That's a simple method to diagnose whether the 
AST is operable or not. If the diastolic pressure is 40 or less, regardless of the, uh, you know, the, you know, the patient is operable. So I have a few slides on calculation, uh, but uh, with lack of time, I should uh, there is a lot of interest on, sir, uh, use of pulmonary vasodilator therapy, uh, treat and close. Sir, what is, uh, sir, your experience on uh, whether does that, does that really predict, uh, you know, uh, the reversibility of the pH? Yeah, because now we have good vasodilators, nitric oxide donors and everything. It is possible that they may have an effect, although, of course, it will go according to the Edwards grade. If, if it's grade six or anything, nobody can do anything. But if you have on the borderline cases, which we, uh, which most of us were not operating, that means four or uh, five or six, you can give vasodilator therapy for two months or three months, bring back the patient, and again try to induce the operability on the cath lab, and then close the AST. And this is possible uh, with uh, interventions that you can do balloon occlusion, see the response, put them on vasodilators do the balloon occlusion again and see the drop in pressure and demonstrate the uh, operability and then you can close. You need not give up early uh, because even those days, we, uh, there was a series from uh, the Institute of Cardiovascular Disease, Chennai, I don't know that might be series in Ames and other places about operating patients with higher pulmonary vascular resistances. And uh, Dr. Cherian came, Cherian was of the view that uh, there is really no upper limit, you can operate and get away. But uh, I don't think, uh, uh, I mean, it's highly debatable. Another issue in our settings is that many uh, pH uh, patients can get pregnant. Yes, and many times the gynae people uh, are very reluctant to do this uh, second trimester abortions. Yes. So, uh, you know, which is a, a, a difficult issue to manage. So how to manage uh, such cases, which uh, uh, therapies are you usually, uh, you know, uh, give to manage yeah, this. Uh, severe pH uh, is a contraindication to pregnancy, but uh, it doesn't apply to our country. A lot of cases do come. I'm sure you must be having a lot of cases in uh, GV Pant at that time also we had. And uh, we have to manage. And uh, I think uh, if the most of these uh, babies are small, small for day, the pregnancy seemed to be tolerated up to the third trimester. And I think uh, uh, in contra... Uh, this thing to previous teaching, if you can manage with good oxygenation and uh, good monitoring and uh, uh, delivery, either uh, uh, with the vaginal delivery, you may be able to pull them out. And of course, you have acidilators which you can immediately give after the delivery. And <clears throat> remember, the use of acidilators, at least for the PGs, is don't overdo uh, vasodilators <coughs> for pH because you must be cautious. Pulmonary artery responds very beautifully. LV will get overloaded, and LV may not be in a position to receive that blood, and it may fail, especially in AST because LV is always underfilled there. So either way, you have to balance between the two. That we have to use a cautious uh, pulmonary vasodilator. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks. Else? Are we stuck? Or? No, no, sir. <laughs> I think we are just listening to you. I don't think there are any questions from the uh, from the students. Are you able to hear? Sir, you told a hemodynamic correlate like a PR, presence of a PR murmur uh, suggests a pressure more than 80. Uh, no, the uh, uh, no, the, the mean pressure sorry. more than 80. Uh, it is a mean pressure more than 80, sir, or uh, the uh, the systolic pressure more than 80? Are the systolic pressure more than the... Uh, more, more than 80. Any other hemodynamic correlates uh, like parastinal heave or uh, you know any, anything else can have a hemodynamic correlates like that? Uh, do we have any other hemodynamic correlates uh, we can? I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure about yes, that. Sir. But ECG correlation is there. If there's a QR pattern yes, in D1, you know very well it is uh, super system. Uh, super system. Super system. I look up that if you think we are there's some study on hemodynamic correlates of. Uh, Actually, I say I don't see any more questions in uh, the chat box, sir, because I think uh, you have uh, wonderfully covered most of the things which are of interest to the students who are exam going. And uh, thank you once again, sir, for your nice talk. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks so much, sir. Thanks. And thank you, Intas, for uh, uh, your uh, technical support. And I think, sir, we would be uh, requesting you again and again for some more topics. And uh, we would like to have more lectures from you, sir. We, 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 I run out of topics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. If you Thank think you. that uh, it is not boring, we can go. I mean, no, no, sir. Not at, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. It's never boring listening to you, sir. You make it more interesting and you know, more uh, thought-provoking as well as you know, more comprehensive for the students. And not only students, sir, even for us. We learn a lot from uh, your lectures, sir. Sir, sporters are quite famous. I think one session on sporters will be very good. Sir has a lot of collection of uh, sporters <laughs> yes, in all the exams. That will be a good uh, thing to do. Yeah, okay, Smooth. I think uh, I'll discuss it out with uh, Mohit yeah. and I think definitely we'll have one uh, no, uh, session on that. I think because uh, spotters is uh, often uh, quite interesting and, uh, you know, uh, and students do get confused and how to go about these spotters. So I think uh, we'll have a uh, lecture Especially on that. Especially our uh, hemodynamic assessment, yes. no? oximetry yes. on one side and yeah. pressures on the other. Other side, okay. yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, uh, on this note, uh, let me thank uh, Dr. K. Balchander for, uh, you know, for, uh, for giving us a good lecture on uh, pulmonary atrial hypertension. And I thank you, uh, Dr. Sumoth, for being a part of this. And uh, thanks, as usual, thanks, Mohit and Dr. Nitish. And uh, thanks, Intas, for partnering, partnering with us in this uh, important endeavor of arts to, you know, to disseminate the knowledge of cardiology to various students of DM and DNB. And I think with this note, I would uh, uh, conclude this session and we would be meeting again on next Thursday at the same time. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.